Hello everybody. Uh, thanks for coming here uh, for the ABCT version of church. <laughs> Sunday morning <laughs> talking about religion, right? Um, so you're here hopefully for the, the proper clinical round table using evidence-based practices of specific religious and non-religious populations. Um, just to kind of introduce everyone, uh, I'm Caleb Black. I come from the land of Oklahoma, University of Central Oklahoma. I'm also, and this relates to what we'll talk about later, uh, the director of something called the Secular Therapy Project, uh, which is uh, a part of an umbrella organization called Recovering from Religion. So that relates directly to what we'll talk about in a minute. We have Hank Robb, uh, who's in private practice up in Oregon. We have David Rosemarian, uh, who's at McLean Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Michelle Pierce from the University of Maryland, Baltimore. And Shadi. Shai, yeah, uh, from the University of Regina up in Canada. So we kind of got people from coast to coast and all over the place here. So, uh, so thank you all for showing up. Is what we're saying because it's very would have been very embarrassing if it was just the five of us. Up there, so, um, as everybody here is, you know, I think well aware at ABCT, uh, evidence-based psychological practice is kind of what we do. That's the whole purpose here, right? And that's where we integrate. Our best available research uh, with clinical expertise in terms of things like patient characteristics, culture, and preferences. Um, and if we're doing optimal evidence-based practice, what we're doing is we're not applying things in this kind of rigid, dogmatic way, but we're using this flexibility with infidelity approach where we flex our CBT in order to make it the most effective it can be for a particular individual. And so, the reason that we wanted to kind of have this discussion today is that literally everyone that you interact with either has some sort of religious or non-religious based belief system, right? Everybody. Um, and there's an increasing amount of research on the impact of those, both religious and non-religious systems, on mental health, on therapeutic outcomes, um, and being able to understand a particular person's belief system, even if you don't hold that belief system yourself, allows you to actually flex that CBT in an optimal way. So that being said, what we're going to do is we're going to have everybody up here give about uh, a 10-ish to 12-minute little presentation about their specific area. Um, and then we're going to have some time for more open discussion, questions, and things like that at the end. So we're going to start with Hank, who's going to talk about spiritual interventions <coughs> of all, even monists. This one will give me. There you go. Okay. Go forward. Uh, so, um, uh, even moments. All right. I um, would say that most people in the world uh, have some sort of dualistic notion. Uh, they have the notion that there are sort of two kinds of stuff, uh, and uh, probably. Lately, in the European tradition, uh, Descartes comes to mind, and he said, well, there's spaceless, weightless, timeless stuff, and then there's other stuff that has uh, spatial, uh, existed time, has spatial extension, and has weight. And then we have these two systems that are interacting. And uh, what I want to bring forward is, uh, well, what about if you just, uh, thought about it as a single kind of stuff. And uh, I don't want to get into what's the nature of the stuff, uh, but it might be possible rather than to think about, well, there's the natural and the supernatural and how do these two kinds of things interact and so on and so forth. Well, what if there was just one kind? And from this perspective, uh, Hayes, Steve Hayes, uh, probably if you've been around it, ACBT lately, you run into him, or uh, his name anyway, actually got started in his direction with this paper, uh, Making Sense of Spirituality, uh, because there is an aspect of being 
that if we think about our body as the source of our uh, sensations, uh, all kinds of bodily sensations, and our mind as the source of our thoughts and images, <clears throat> there may be another aspect that is neither one. So what I'd like to see if I can do is to effectively not tell you about, but give you some experience of this possibility. And I recognize I may not be successful for those who I fail with. I apologize for wasting your time, um, but uh, we'll just give it a go. So I'll invite you to notice anything. You can notice the uh, uh, screen, you can notice the way the uh, chair is supporting your body, you can uh, notice uh, your breathing, anything will do. And then secondarily, see if you can notice that you're noticing. Now that second part is not a requirement, but it's often useful to see if you can do both things, not only notice, but notice that you're noticing. And if you're doing those things, or even the first one, and I ask you, who is doing that, then very likely you will hear some blah, 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 like me or I am, and it ought to be pretty clear that the aspect of you that's doing that is not blah, blah, blah. It's not me or I am. Those words are pointing to an aspect of your being that is doing it. And if I give you this rather odd instruction, but one I think you can find, uh, that one you can follow, to take yourself to that place. Take yourself to the place from which you notice, and even notice that you're noticing. So, kind of by show of hands, even if your eyes are closed, give me an indication if you're there by raising your hand. Get to that place from which you can notice and even notice that you're noticing. So, I'm successful with some of you. Now, <clears throat> the rest of you, I just beg your indulgence. But for those of you who are there, uh, I invite you to notice if it seems right to say, from this place, I have a mind and a body in the same way that I have shoes, or glasses, or the ID that uh, I was given to show up at this convention. These are things not that I am, but things that I possess. And if you have that sense, there's clearly a sense that there is another aspect to your being other than your mind and your body. And in ordinary English language, at least in the U.S. where I grew up, this little triumvirate of mind, body, spirit is not unusual to hear people speak of. So if you're at this place, this place from which you are not your mind and body, but have a mind, then you can think of them as servants, servants that can be put to use for this dimension, you might call it this spiritual dimension, of your existence. Now, it's better to have strong servants than weak ones. You can get more done with strong servants. It's so not a good idea if they take over the household. Then the person who's supposed to be running the show is no longer in charge. Now another aspect of this uh, experience that you may be able to come in contact with is from this place you can be pretty confident of moving your hands and arms and feet and mouth in any way that you choose to do so. That notion of, well, I'm not in control of my body, if you're at this place, will seem rather foreign. 
how many of you, just by show of hands, can get that sense of, well, at this place, when it comes to moving my hands and arms and feet and mouth, or resisting doing so, in this place, I can control that. And it's a sense of some place that has been there a long time. If you kind of for a moment travel back to when you were six or seven and eight and had a very different mind and a very different body, this place seems to have changed hardly at all. Seem inexperientially so. Across that span of time, there's been very, very painful experiences that have been noticed from this place. And, if you're lucky, some deeply joyous ones. And yet, this place seems not to have changed at all. In other words, it can make contact with the world and not be much affected by it. Now, a couple of other things that may be true about this place is you can pick to do anything that you can do, including what you want to make important in your life. If you wanted to make be the best parent I could be, be the best healthcare worker I can be, from this place, you could pick that and follow it. Now, a couple of my favorite saints, <clears throat> John and Paul, Lennon and McCartney, that is, said, there's nothing you can do that can't be done. And from this place, you may have the experience. There's nothing I can do that can't be done from here. And finally, when it comes to evaluating this place, there is a kind of a buzz or isness or beingness about it, which you might find that you like. But there's no particular goodness or badness about it. You seem to have passed between those polarities. So I invite you to come back and uh, I didn't have any financial things, so quickly go through that. If we think of act as meaning accept the world as it is, was, or may be, choose and willingly follow your leading principles and values. By leading principles, I mean directions you want to go in life. And by values, I mean the way you travel. And certainly one way you can travel is willingly versus grudgingly. Those are all things that can be done from the place that I just invited you to be. And finally, teach others. There'll never be enough if uh, others are not taught this same sense of experience. And while I have more, in the service of being kindly to my colleagues, uh, I think I will uh, defer. Thank you. Hank, it's always an experience to be on a panel with you. Not only do I learn something, but I'm a different human being. <laughs> I think your point's well taken that uh, you know, spiritual interventions, I think, are, Whoa! <laughs> they're so spiritual that we can't even sit on our chair. There we go. <laughs> they, uh, well, I can't do it well. <laughs> <laughs> they uh, have applications well beyond the specific religious populations that uh, I think the next three of us are going to be speaking about. Um, so just let me pull up. I'm not doing slides. I'm going to do, I'm just going to speak. Um,
Great. Thanks, Caleb, for putting the CRT together and for all of you for coming. It's nice that we're not outnumbered on a Sunday morning at this hour. Um, so by way of introduction, uh, my name is David Ross Marin. I do research and academic work at McLean Hospital on spirituality and mental health. I'm director of a spirituality and mental health program out there. And I'm, uh, specific, well, there's a whole bunch of stuff. And I talked about that on Friday. If you came, then you don't know about it. And if not, then you'll have to catch me next year. Or you can see my upcoming book with Guilford in, uh, in April 2018 on uh, spirituality, religion, and cognitive behavior therapy. But that's not what I'm here to talk to you about today. Um, I have another hat that I don, uh, which is that I'm the founder and the director of an outpatient program or series of programs called the Center for Anxiety, which is located in the New York area. There are actually three offices at this point with 20 staff. And in fact, my partner and program director is in the back there, David Braid. Hello. So we, um, over the last seven years, we've grown to become the largest outpatient provider of outpatient mental health services in the Orthodox Jewish world. We've had, um, which is not huge, but we had 300 new patients this year, um, which I'm very proud of, and um, that's Orthodox patients. And we do service non-religious non and non-Jewish patients as well. We're located in Manhattan, at one of our offices anyway, and I would say about 50-50 about there, yeah, but the Brooklyn offices and the, and the one, we have one in Rockland County, New York, and those are much more densely populated Orthodox Jewish areas. So in addition to the fact that I am a practicing Orthodox Jew and a CBT clinician, and somebody who takes spirituality and religion seriously in my professional life, I'm really here specifically to speak to you about what it's like to practice evidence-based services with the Jewish population. Cool? Okay, so first some facts and figures about Judaism and, and, and uh, Jewish life, in case you don't know. The worldwide Jewish population is pretty small. Um, 15 million people. That's an M, not, you know, 15, one, five. We're talking about 0.2% of the population of the world. About 6.5 million live in Israel, 6.5 million live in the United States, and the next down from that is France, Canada, the UK, Russia. There are only eight countries that have 100,000 Jews or more. Um, aside from Israel, in fact, there is no country in the world where the Jewish population exceeds 2.5% of the population. This is not a large group of human beings. The historical peak was not much more than that. It was 17 million prior to the, uh, the Holocaust and World War II. After that, it was 11 million. And that grew to 13 to 14 million by the 1970s, and it's basically stayed stagnant. The reason why is largely due to assimilation and people losing their Jewish identity. Um, so the growth has been somewhere between 0 and 0.75% over the last couple years. Now, despite that small size, uh, the Jewish people have had a very uh, large and a disproportionately large impact on society. Um, 170 Nobel Prize winners have been Jewish. That's 22% of all Nobel Prize winners. Uh, the 157 um, recipients of the U.S. National Medal of Science, that's 37%, more than a third of total winners. Um, and a lot of folks here at ABCT, by the way, if you look around, it's very disproportionately Jewish. Um, but also you find um, Jews in media, entertainment, finance, law, medicine, and academia. Um, now, why that is, way beyond what we're going to speak about. But I wanted to provide you with a little bit of context. Now, what is Judaism? Well, it's not an easy question to answer, actually, because Jews are not united by culture. You find people of Eastern uh, heritage, Western heritage. Uh, we're not united by language, even. I, there are people who I know who are Jewish who only speak Yiddish. I speak a visele Yiddish, as they say, nothing. Like, I, a nisht. I, I do not speak Yiddish at all. There are people who don't speak English, and they live in New York. There are other people who are, are you know, you can find people, any culture, any language. Um, you don't find uh, that uh, Jews are united by country, and not even by a religion anymore because there's a lot of religious differences. Um, you can live anywhere on earth and have various, very widely different practices and beliefs. So what does it mean to be Jewish? So in principle, it's a monotheistic faith that has the Torah as its foundational text. Um, but there are a lot of religious differences, and that's germane to our discussion this morning about practicing across a broad spectrum. Um, Principally, though, there are basically four camps in the modern Jewish world. You find secular Jews who have a Jewish identity, but they really don't have specific religious beliefs or practices. That's about 50% of the Jewish world today. Then you have traditional Jews who they identify and they practice Jewish religious uh, aspects, but only as a cultural practice. 
It's not necessarily having a lot of uh, religious meaning, but they'll practice it more as a culture. Then you have religious Jews who practice the ritual, rituals and they're trying to connect to God. There's definitely a monotheistic way of connecting. And then you find ultra-Orthodox Jews who are very punctilious in their practice. And the divisions are about 50% secular, 25% traditional, but 75% of Jews who are on the left, non, 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 on the left side of religion, let's just say, 15% um, religious and about 10% ultra-Orthodox. Now, the Orthodox and the religious groups are growing rapidly in terms of birth rates, while the other groups are decreasing because of assimilation. So what you find is that's shifting, and um, they're, like for example, 98% of religious and ultra-Orthodox Jews will marry within the faith. Okay, so in the course of my clinical work, there are a number of different things that can come up. Um, in, with Jews, and this is across the spectrum, religious or non-religious, family. <laughs> Jews from across the spectrum of religious involvement have a very family-centric, have, typically have family-centric values. And they're more likely than individuals in the general population to get married, uh, more likely to have children, and that sets a, a rich set of resources to work with, because you're dealing with family structures, and those can be, people can be confederates in treatment, but also there's a lot of risk for family contextualized concerns. In my office, when we get calls from patients, sometimes it's the patient's grandmother who calls. I'm not kidding. Um, and we have to explain to them, well, you know, they ha there has to be at the, you know, your, your son, daughter, and potentially your grandchild as well have to be involved in order to involve you in the care. Typically they are, they want to be involved. So we do a lot of family-based uh, CBT, which is actually very helpful, um, but uh, can be very helpful. Sometimes it's aunts, uncles, cousins. We even had neighbors call, which has been very interesting. Um, that's the next thing, which is community. Um, academic study and learning are, are very much a key value, and the school systems are really um, a, very much a, a source of community, which are, tend to be private on the religious side of the spectrum. And they're very much involved in clinical care. So we'll often go have teachers, principals, other school personnel. The child psychologists on my staff are thrilled, because if you don't involve family members in schools, you're, you know, with one hour of session with a, with a child on a weekly basis, how much is going to generalize, but if you do a TCIT program, a teacher-child um, uh, uh, um, based program, then you can, you can actually affect really whole systems. So it, it actually worked out really well. Another theme that comes up is anti-Semitism. It's, it's not, thankfully, in the United States anyway, it's not very common. In Israel, it's more common because of security concerns from hostile neighboring countries, and obviously that does really impact day-to-day -day life and the way people, people live there. And I, I do consult out there a couple times a year. But another thing we find in the United States though is intergenerational trauma, which it, that, you can find that even two generations after the Holocaust, that Holocaust survivors came and tried to rebuild their lives and it was not easy. I mean, a lot of them lost their entire families, sometimes their entire communities. You find people who are the lone survivor of a, a count of 10,000 people in Eastern Europe, they came to the United States with the shirt on their back or not and had to rebuild their lives from scratch with a bunch of you know, strangers who they've never met before. So that impacts not only their children, but their grandchildren. It's, it's, it, and, and you can see that even today. Um, at a, without getting into whole intergenerational trauma, and there is some research on it, um, which is interesting, um, what you find is that uh, you have sometimes complex relationships between parents and children and parents and grandchildren and how uh, religious identity weaves into um, their psychological framework day to day, and that can, let's just say it gets complex, and that's something that sometimes has to be dealt with. I guess the other thing, though, is spiritual and religious issues which come up. This is mostly among Orthodox or religious um, Jews. Um, there are very unique issues, um, and I'll just talk to you about a couple of what those are. Um, firstly, there are spiritual or religious symptoms. Now, this is when religious issues, uh, when, sorry, when psychopathology, rather, will co-opt a religious presentation. For example, scrupulosity and OCD, when people have obsessive compulsive disorder that takes on religious themes, or religious delusion, delusions and, psycho and psychotic disorders, hyper-religiosity and mania is another third example. And in terms of how do we work with this clinically, whether it's in the Jewish population or not, but specifically in the Jewish population, the first step is to demarcate where does genuine spirituality or religion end and the psychosis or the OCD or the mania or whatever it is take over? And it's really drawing a Venn diagram and getting those lines really clear, both from the clinician standpoint and for the patient. 
So they understand that the fact that they're, let's say, washing their hands once in the morning is a ritual and a bona fide one that has 3,300 year rich, rich religious history. And I wouldn't necessarily want them not doing that because it connects them to their faith and to their, to their, to their community and to their family. But the fact that they've washed 15 times throughout the day and didn't necessarily have to do that to get insight that you know, the religion stops after one or two or whole, whatever it is within the ritual rite, and then after that becomes the OCD, and that latter one becomes the target. And getting um, insight into that and ha having that is, is definitely an important step. Um, I'll tell you about some cases. I saw a 27-year-old uh, devoutly Orthodox Jewish female, daughter of actually a pretty famous rabbi. She had scrupulosity and was centered around this ritualistic perfectionism. She wanted to ward off these medical problems by engaging in her rituals in a very specific and mechanized and perfectionistic manner. So we used exposure therapy to target each symptom one by one, but I validated her spiritual beliefs. I didn't say like, come on, give me a break, like God's gonna help you. For, for, aside from the fact that that wouldn't be something that I would say for my own value set, I, it, wasn't, it wasn't clinically indicated, frankly, because I thought that the fact that she had faith was a positive thing for her, and it turned out to be extremely positive at the end. It was an emotion regulation and grounding tool for her to be able to get through her exposures. So it was actually critical for the exposure process. But we did make it clear that with, her, with the help of her clergy, that there were certain things that she was doing that had no basis within her religious framework, and those were, were amazing targets for us to work with in, in the concept of treatment. Um, there's also religious coping. That's sort of another way that religion and spirituality can interface with, again, with the Jewish population, really anything. Religious coping is the, is the utilization of religion or spirituality, frankly, to, to cope with distress, to deal with stressful situations. Sometimes people are going through a stressful time and they say, oh, well, I'm having a hard time, but this is God's will, and ultimately it's for my good. I don't understand why that is, but I really believe that there's a rhyme and a reason here. And um, that can be, that's, that, I mean, uh, statistically that's associated with better functioning uh, in the context of, uh, for example, coping with a cancer diagnosis and other things as well. Um, but sometimes it's religious activity, whether it's prayer, speaking to one's clergy, talking to other people about it, studying religious texts in order to cope with distress. And these are basically emotion regulation strategies, um, but it's a well-researched construct with, uh, I don't know, nearly 10,000 citations. You check out Google Scholar, Google Religious, check out Religious Coping, and you'll see some pretty cool data. Anyhow, working with this clinically is um, I th a, fun a functional assessment. What is, the, what is the function of this person's engagement with this religious coping in, in their distress? Is it making it things better? And the data suggests that on whole it will, but sometimes it could be an avoidance strategy, so we want to be a little mindful of that. But what's, what is the function of this behavior? Is it giving them a different cognitive assessment of the situation? Is it giving them a distraction, is, uh, which could be positive or negative? Is it helping them to regulate their emotions again? Is it distress tolerance? There's so many different functions that it could serve. Read my book for more ideas. Um, the second step is either to encourage that and facilitate it or redirect it or potentially target it for cessation and then provide alternatives while validating the patient's spiritual framework. Um, I'll give you one more, uh, I'm not going to give you another case example because of time, but another thing is spiritual and religious struggles. This is really the third way that we see spirituality playing out in the Jewish world, but again, beyond as well, uh, in terms of uh, working with it clinically. What is a spiritual struggle? Firstly, it's the utilization of spirituality or religion in a manner that's functionally maladaptive. It makes things worse. Now, that can be interpersonal, or intrapersonal rather. Let's say somebody um, has, uh, you see religious identity crisis happening in the context of BPD, of, bipolar, of, uh, of uh, uh, borderline personality disorder, where people were from a religious family, they had a religious identity, and then in the context of their emotional distress and their emotions becoming for lack of a better word, haywire, who am I? Am I an evil person? Do I really believe? I felt like I didn't believe the other day. I hated God. Does that mean that I don't believe? Does it mean I really hate God? Maybe I feel really connected, maybe I don't. And there, that, that can be some, that can be a, a clinical issue. I don't think that's a spiritual symptom. I think it's a spiritual struggle, where the person's actually struggling in the domain of spirituality, which feeds back then into their psychopathology. Um, another thing is interpersonal, complicated relationships with religious leaders, complicated relationships with family members around religion. Say a family member is forcing religion down uh, another person's throat, whether that's a spouse or whether it's a parent. Those can lead to spiritual struggles where the, the afflicted party feels very, not only disconnected from the other person, but disconnected from their spirituality. 
And then, like, what do they do with that? Now, do I want to have religion in my life? Do I want to be spiritual? I thought I believed in God. I thought I wanted this. And there are aspects of my faith that I like, but I'm so burned by this person. What do I do? So those are issues that have to be well worked with. Now, how do we do this? So the first step is to get the patient to articulate the struggle, just to have them articulate the concern. What is it? And to get an ear for it, just being able to speak about it in therapy is, is helpful to the patient, you know, a la, Rod, a la Carl, Carl Rogers or otherwise. The second is to validate, to say, yeah, well, if I had a religious identity and then I didn't know because of my emotions where I held, or, or if I had this sense of spirituality, but then somebody from left field came and sucker punched me and I felt disconnected from my faith because of it, I would also feel fill in the blank, depressed, panicky, you know, anxious, uh, upset. Um, so validation. And the third step really depends on the patient, which is if they're not ready to address the spiritual struggle in session, I would encourage them to speak to clergy. I would encourage them to read about it. Sometimes when people have spiritual struggles, they engage in social, and cognit uh, social cognitive, and emotional distancing from their spirituality. Like, um, it's kind of like a bad relationship. Like when you have a fight with somebody, like you don't want to speak to them and you'll avoid them, but then like, they come back into your periphery, either through a Facebook post or otherwise, and then it's a big trigger for you. So it's the same thing in the spiritual domain, that when a person's having a spiritual struggle in that relationship, if you will, <laughs> excuse me, then instead of facing it and dealing with it and reading about it and speaking with people about it and re resolving the struggle, they'll distance themselves from it cognitively and emotionally and socially and, and environmentally, and then what that ends up doing is creating a, a constant and, and a vulnerability to that struggle, which can perpetuate its effects. Um, I'm not going to share another case with you uh, because of a lack of time, but suffice it to say that these three issues provide a lot of really rich, interesting, fun things to do. And moreover, I think they find they, they provide behavior therapists with, with it really shows how broad of a structure we have in behavior therapy and how it applies not only to emotional life and to social life, but it actually applies, I think, to spiritual and religious life as well. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? So I'm going to be speaking about cognitive behavioral therapy for Christians with depression. What I'm noticing, I think, is what we're talking about is sort of these specific religions, but I think a lot of what you can take from you know, this presentation on Christians is applicable to each of the different religions that you might talk about. So um, hopefully you'll find some overlap here. Okay, so I'd like to talk briefly about what is Christian CBT. I'll give you some seven practical tools about how to work with Christians using CBT. And then give you some specific resources for what you can do with these clients. Okay, so what is Christian CBT? I think you're all very familiar with this model of how our thoughts and our feelings and our behaviors are all interconnected. <coughs> and what's unique? <coughs> so when we're talking about Christian CBT, uh, we're using a lot of the same principles and the same tools as conventional CBT, but what's unique is using the client's Christian tradition or Christian beliefs and um, Christian practices to be able to provide that foundation to provide tools to be able to change their thoughts and to change their, their behaviors. Okay, so let me just talk a little bit about the multi-site randomized control trial that we did. And this was for religiously integrated CBT. And so what we did is we compared remotely delivered CBT, religiously integrated CBT, with conventional CBT. And we did this to treat depression among people who had a medical illness. So we had a sample size of 132 that was about equally divided between the two groups. 69% were female, and the mean age was about 52. So we had a manualized treatment, uh, a manual and a, a patient workbook for each of five different religions, and I'll talk about those in a moment. We had 10 sessions, and each session lasted for about 50 or 60 minutes. So as you can see here, we had these five religions most of our sample ended up being Christian, so that's why I kind of translated this into Christian CBT. Um, so I developed the Christian manual and the patient workbook for Christianity as a prototype. And then we had people who are experts in the field in the different religions and CBT who translated them into different religions. And so 
Dr. Rosemary did the, the Judaism one, as you can expect. Okay, and so what did we find? Well, as you can see here, we found that both the conventional CBT and the religiously integrated CBT were equally effective in reducing depression. So that equally effective at 12 weeks at the end of the intervention, and also at follow-up three months later. What, so in other words, you can say that the religiously integrated CBT was as effective as conventional CBT. I think what was really interesting is that the, the highly religious clients were more likely to respond to religiously integrated CBT. So there was something about that way of develop, delivering CBT that was really effective for them. Okay, so I'd like to make this really practical for you and provide you with seven different tools. So really took the manual and decided, if we condense that manual, what were the seven sort of essence or the seven tools that were really helpful in this? And there were four cognitive tools and three behavioral tools. So you can think about religion and whatever religion what we're talking about really as a way of thinking about, like, here's an ideal way of thinking and here's an ideal way of behaving across all religions. So in this sense, you know, we're talking about Christianity, we can think about it sort of larger than that. So the first one was, I called it renewing your mind. And if, you, if you're familiar with the Bible, that's actually from one of the verses in the Bible. Renew your mind or planting truth. So the, the concept here is really, how can we fill a client's mind with very positive and truthful thoughts as a mind renewing activity? And we thought there are two ways to do that. One is they could memorize scripture, and the second is that they could really contemplate, you know, contemplate a prayer, so go, go deeper on that scripture. So what we did is we had for each of the sessions, in this case from the Bible, a memory verse that they would memorize that week that was related to the topic. And our thinking was that the more of this sort of based on their worldview, these positive thoughts they could put in their minds, like building an arsenal or um, putting deposits in a bank account, the more that they could use that to transform their thoughts later. So, how many of you are familiar with the thought log? And cognitive distortions? Yeah. So, this is what this next tool is to so change in your mind or metanoia. So, metanoia is an ancient Greek word which means to repent, or it actually means to change your way of thinking about something. So, for this tool, we simply took that thought log and we did two things for it. So, when we're teaching the cognitive distortions, the first thing we did was we added a theological reflection for each of the cognitive distortions. And I'll give you an example of that in a moment. And then the, the second thing we did, you can see as I put in the, the R step, and that stands for religious beliefs and resources. So when they get to D, which is dispute, dispute your thoughts, they're pulling in on their religious worldview to be able to help to transform that way of thinking. And I'll take you through an example of that too. Okay, so, the should statement, you're probably very familiar with that. Should do something, ought to do something, must do something. And what it would look like when we gave them the handout is that they would get a theological reflection, in this case again from Christianity. So there'd just be a little paragraph here about why from the Christian belief system, a should statement is a cognitive distortion. And it just seemed to hold a little more weight than the therapist just saying, hey, you shouldn't have a should statement here based on your worldview, why? So let me take you through, I won't go through the whole thought log, I just wanted to show you the step R here. So on the thought log, it would look like this, religious beliefs and resources. So it asks them the question, how can your view of God or the sacred, your religious worldview, sacred writing, spiritual wisdom, how can all of that provide evidence to challenge these automatic negative thoughts? So I had a young man, and he was you know, struggling with feeling like he was a fraud, and he was going to let his father down. And so his thought log for this step, he came up with, he didn't have to actually put verses, but he put verses. And so he would call, you know, this, the one in Romans 8, is a shame buster, or he found one that really boosted his courage, or he found you know, one that was a promise of help. And from all that, he was able to come to a thought, you know, if God's not condemning me, then I can need to stop condemning myself, and I don't need to do this on my own. So it was really interesting that we did step D, and he knew he had a, a negative thought, he just couldn't seem to shift it. And when we plugged in his religious worldview, 
you would be able to find some stronger evidence to be able to shift that way of thinking. So the next cognitive tool, I called it redemptive reframing. And really, if you think about it, in cognitive behavioral therapy, at least the cognitive part, all we're doing is reframing. And we're, thinking we're coming up with a different perspective. But this is redemptive. So I'd say you're, what they're doing is they're finding God, and they're finding the blessing in the suffering. There's two steps. I think it's really important to do the steps in order. It's first, as uh, David was talking about, acknowledge and explore what are these spiritual struggles? What are these sacred losses? Really validate, really allow them to express that. Sometimes, at least within Christianity, to be angry at God or to have issues related to your faith, there's a lot of shame around that, and they don't talk about it. So this is a safe place for them to do that. And then, once they've had a chance to do that, help them to reframe this suffering Taking a very a larger, more faith-filled perspective. So where where could you say that God has been actively at work in this? Where can you see His hand in this? Where might there be some blessings that could come from this? And then the fourth cognitive tool is acceptance and forgiveness. So this isn't necessarily Christian um, or even religious, but from this perspective, you would pull in those religious beliefs. So another way to frame this is it's a letting go, but then there's the extra step. You're letting go in order to let God. Right? So again, two steps. You want to explore those hurts. You want to explore those resentments. You want to say, just forgive before you've explored it and rationally or validated and all the rest of it. But then once they've done that step, to be able to engage with forgiveness and act of surrender. Again, from their religious perspective, whatever that means to them. And then moving into the behavioral tools, the first one we have is reaching out and connecting. Or it might simply say here's social support. Right? But in this context, we're talking about involvement in a religious community. And this would to be combat the, so the social isolation, the lack of purposeful activity that's a part of depression. And it's not prescriptive. Right? We can't tell someone you have to go to church. But it is sort of a reminding of what's this helpful to you in the past. Is this something you were involved in? What are some of your options to get connected? And then finally, it wasn't just how can you reach out and get connected so you can get all this support? It was also, how can you reach out and provide that support to someone else? So we had them actually find someone in their community that they could pray for and that they could support. And so they're actively living out their faith as part of this step. Okay, another behavioral tool is saying thanks or gratitude. If you're familiar with the positive psychology literature, you know that this is really effective for depression. So it is a cognitive shift, but it's also a behavioral shift. And this would be, and I think it's David's work as well, there's something extra about religious gratitude. So we all know how it makes us feel good to be thankful for something. And some studies have shown that if you're actually thankful to God or for religious gratitude, that there's something extra about that. So one of my clients put it this way. There's this verse in the New Testament, and it talks about being thankful in all things. Not for all things, but in all things. And so when I was explaining this to one of my clients, she said, oh my gosh, I've been a one-way thinker my whole life. I've given thanks when things are going well, but I've never thought of giving thanks in the negative times. And then the last behavioral tool is service, or giving back. And there really is research that shows that it, it does seem to be uh, better to give than to receive. We get that support, but also to give that support is really helpful. So shifting the focus off of yourself, off of your own problems, and really extending that love and extending that service to others. So that was really quick, um, <laughs> survey of what the seven tools were. Uh, like David, I had a book come out last year. So this is Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Christians with Depression. So this talks about what is uh, this type of therapy, how do you do the assessment, how would you explain the concept to clients each chapter, um, there talks about one of the different tools. There's a chapter up for clergy as well. Um, other tools or resources for you. Um, the manuals, so for each of the five religions, we had the manual in the workbook. So this, and if you want to email, you can do that too. I'll send this to you. Um, for free online are the different manuals in the workbooks. That's the book. And then if you're not familiar with APA Division 36, that's a great one too. And that's our email if you want the slides. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for being here on a, on a beautiful Sunday morning. 
Um, I do have a lot of slides, but I kind of just want to have a conversation with you more than anything. Okay? So, uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today is doing cognitive behavioral therapy with Muslim clients and some of the considerations that might come in. And I think um, I'm pretty excited about sharing a little bit of a pilot project with you. And, I, and this is where I really want to engage both the panel as well as the audience uh, in kind of getting your reactions as well as some of the thoughts about what that particular study. Um, so yeah, so first I'll, I'll build it, I'll build the case for why we need uh, religiously sensitive CBT, although I'm clearly I'm preaching to the audience if, or preaching to the choir if, if you're here. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk, uh, I'm gonna kind of blitz through the considerations for applying CBT with Muslim clients. And then I'm gonna talk to you about that pilot project with about 280 people that, that uh, we recruited. And then finally, we're going to, again, give you a very quick take-home message. Hopefully something that's uh, applied that you can take home and start working on. So, as pretty much everybody already told you, religion as well as non-religion is a fact of life. Okay? So, if you're anywhere around the world, you will probably talk to somebody who is religious, uh, or non-religious, that you can be sure of. Uh, in terms of the sheer numbers of, uh, of uh, people who identify with the Muslim religion, there are about 1.6 billion people around the world who endorse Islam as their main uh, religion or their main source of spirituality. Uh, and there are about 100 or over 100 million uh, followers of Islam in the Western world, including places like Canada and the United States. Um, and, of course, religion takes on many forms. So people of, of all kinds of races, ethnicities, uh, so on and so forth, could, could be religious and, in fact, could be Muslim, Christian, whatever it may be. So I, I, think, I think you would probably agree that uh, trying to understand and try to apply things like CBT with a religious or even non-religious communities is something that's very important that we should pay close attention to. Um, and we also know that a one-size you know, one fits all approach to doing cognitive behavioral therapy may be harmful in the, in the long run, actually. Uh, so we know that when treatment is not sensitive to people's unique needs and treatment, uh, dropout rates are high. Okay? And we also know that uh, keeping people in treatment for a longer period um, is, is obviously practical for outcome purposes, but also it's ethical because you're keeping them there longer. Uh, and of course, outcomes tend to go in the same direction if you're keeping them there for a longer period. So, work from people here in this panel, as well as work from other people that are, that are not here today, shows us that religiously sensitive CBT works for its intended purposes, in the sense that it does better. And again, when I use the word better, it doesn't necessarily mean that it does better in terms of outcome, although there is some evidence that, uh, that it may do so. Um, but I think it's a winner if it does any part of therapy a little bit better, in terms of, as I said, keeping people in treatment for a little bit longer, uh, reducing dropout rates, uh, increasing retention, um, whatever it may be, even increasing therapeutic alliance. And I think all these things ultimately will translate to better outcomes in terms of symptom reduction. But at the end of the day, better could be any, take on any form. And I think religiously sensitive CBT, and we do have a lot of data to support this idea, uh, does better. All right, I'll let you in on a little, a little tip or a little secret. I, I can skip this part, and I don't think you'll be missing very much from my presentation. The reason for that is um, I could sit here and talk to you about Islam until we're all blue in the face. Um, but the reality is, every single client that we see is extremely unique, of course. Okay. So I personally think, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm hoping we can get some discussion around this point, doing religiously sensitive CBT, uh, I think, starts and also ends at training and learning how to do very effective case conceptualization. So that's really, really what I, what I think here today. Because even, even if somebody says they're Muslim, they may or may not identify with certain parts of Islam, uh, or they may 
uh, you know, Islam may not even be a huge part of their life. And at that point, you need to, of course, change course a little bit if you were planning on doing religiously sensitive CBD. So at the end of the day, I really do think, and if you want to take one point at all out of this presentation, is that um, strong case conceptualization is really is a really important part of, of doing any kind of adaptive treatment, including uh, religiously adaptive treatment. There, if, if again, and I'm, t I'm talking about generalities here, this is where uh, talking about aggregate level data, and from the aggregate level data, we understand that uh, people who uh, endorse Islam may have different conceptualization as to how psychopathology develops from, from the uh, classic cognitive behavioral model, if you will. Uh, we also understand that there are certain differences amongst people who, um, who endorse Islam as their main religion in the way they seek help. And again, I think these two things are linked. If you have a certain etiological model as to where you think your psychopathology comes from, you know, where your depression or anxiety comes from, um, let's say if you think your, your, uh, your depression or anxiety is biologically based, chances are you're probably not going to be seeking help in the form of psychotherapy if you don't think these two things connect at all. Okay, so these two things certainly follow from each other. Uh, again, in terms of talking about considerations in doing, in doing uh, religiously sensitive CBT with Muslim clients, there are gender considerations. There is some evidence to suggest that matching genders, especially if the client is a woman, uh, getting a, a female therapist uh, seems to produce a little bit better results for women, uh, Muslim women. Um, we know that CBT does well in comparison to other treatments because CBT is more on the directive side of things and that seems to mesh well with the Islamic tradition. Again, we're talking generalities, we're talking aggregate data here. Okay? Um, we also know that uh, people who espouse Islam as, as their main religion, also tend to, uh, again, on average, think of the self as inter in interdependent as opposed to independent. And for that reason, um, a lot of therapists may choose, and it, there's evidence that, that this is effective, they choose to involve other party, uh, other people from the client's family, for example, or religious leaders as part of the treatment process. And, there is some evidence to suggest that this is helpful for somebody who is traditionally Muslim. There has been some debate about this idea of religious matching. Um, and as it turns out, and the only thing I have to tell you, your knowledge of the particular religion, whether it be you're Christian or non-religious yourself or whatever it may be, so your, your knowledge of the particular uh, religion, in this case Islam, Trumps, if I may use that word, trumps, um, trumps your particular belief system, if that makes any sense. So I kind of summarize major areas where there might be clash between cognitive behavioral therapy and traditional Islam. And again, I'm using aggregate level data. And if you notice here, three of these possible points of clash relate to something, which I think that something is fatalism. Okay. So for that purpose, we, uh, myself and a student of mine, went out and we kind of did a little bit of a literature review on this idea of fatalism, and we found out that the literature is a bit um, vacuous in the sense that there's not much out there. Uh, but what, from, from what we know, from what's out there, is that uh, classic fatalism seems to be associated with poor, poorer outcomes, both for physical health as well as for mental health. So we wanted to, to replicate that. We wanted to see if this is true. So we went out, we did an online study of about 280 people. Uh, unfortunately, the Islamic sample was quite small, but from what we got from that data is that Muslims scored higher on this classic fatalism than than did Christians in that sample. And it was a statistically significant difference. What we also found 
and this replicates some of the stuff that was found in previous literature, is that fatalism, um, and again, let me define fatalism, or, or you know what, let, let's solicit ideas here. What do you think fatalism is? What does that mean to you when you hear the word fatalism? Spiritual external locus of control. Spiritual external locus of control. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> does everybody agree with that definition? <laughs> Everybody agree with that? So, we found that this classic fatalism is associated with depression symptoms, anxiety symptoms, stress, negative coping. Um, negative coping is substance use, um, things like suppression of emotions, uh, things like rumination. But we started, and this is kind of a graphical depiction of that, so this is uh, depression scores in classic fatalism associated at about 0.39, which is not negligible. We started asking ourselves a question, and this is where I want to solicit some ideas from you. Could there be two types of fatalisms? One that's kind of passive, which is the classic form of fatalism, and one that's more active and more directive type of fatalism? And it's, it sounds a bit paradoxical, of course, to think about that. I don't know, maybe I'll invite people in the panel to, to jump in here. Well, it reminds me of the concept of spiritual surrender, which is the, and yeah. Bergman has found that that's a very active type of, coach, of active, coping. Active spiritual surrender. Active yeah. spiritual surrender, yeah. That's between two of them. When I, uh, yeah, please. when I was in my 20s, I tried about 1,500 times to slam dunk a basketball, and I found that I couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I didn't, I thought, well, it's not another 1,500 times I need. I think I'll work on my outside shot. And it turns out that uh, me and um, a number of famous NBA stars have the same thing going. Sometimes our outside shot goes in and sometimes not. So the question is, do I work on my outside shot and leave whether it goes in or out to God, or do I not bother to work on it? I think maybe that's the distinction you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So we found that uh, we asked a couple of questions about this act of fatalism, and the way we defined it was, um, so even though everything's in God's will, I have to do my part. To, to bring about God's will. Okay. We found that Muslims actually scored higher on active fatalism than did Christians, and active fatalism and the classic fatalism were not correlated in any, in any way. We also found that this act of fatalism uh, is, is negatively associated with many of these poor outcomes. Okay. So it's negatively associated with depression, with, uh, with anxieties, with stress symptoms, and I think, interestingly, it was moderately, close to moderately associated with positive coping. And this is kind of, again, graphical depiction. So it's positively associated with, with positive coping. Uh, again, we haven't really delved very deep into this, uh, into this data set yet, but I, I, I'm wondering if some, there's some kind of mediation here going on in terms of, uh, so the, the relationship of active fatalism and depression may or may not be mediated by this positive coping. So very quickly now, I'll run through some clinical implications and take home. So Islam, unlike uh, some other faiths, is an orthopraxy, which means that the emphasis in the religion is really on uh, articles of, uh, so, sorry, not articles of faith, but, but actual behavior. And for that reason, I think it can fit particularly well with cognitive behavioral approaches. Um, for some people where their, their uh, distress may be associated with some religious core beliefs, it might not be a very good idea to work on these core beliefs because that may actually cause some more distress and there is some literature to suggest that. In fact, there's literature, and I was at a talk um, with Christine Podesky, where working on core beliefs generally tends to make people feel worse, it turns out. Uh, it turns out that infusing religious elements, uh, 
especially Islamic elements when it, when it comes to doing uh, religiously sensitive CBT with Muslim clients, infusing these religious elements into the treatment may be better. And again, I'm defining better um, fairly, fairly widely here. Um, and there may be a, a, an opportunity here to separate fatalism, as is classically defined, from something that's a little bit more active, like a spiritual surrender or active fatalism, because active fatalism may in fact be associated with better outcomes. And again, if you want to take one point out of this entire talk is that every single client that you'll see is unique. You know, so not every Muslim client is going to look the same or behave the same or have the same needs. Um, and if you're just practicing good CBT generally, it starts and ends at very good case conceptualization. And I think for that reason, we really, really have to get really good case conceptualizations, uh, especially when working with these kind of diversity populations. A few take home messages here. And again, I think the, the bottom line here is um, when working with Muslim clients, there may be some theoretical clash between CBT and, and Islam. Uh, but for the most part, these things, you know, these two traditions are relatively harmonious, and I think uh, it is the on the onus of, of uh, the the therapist to work collaboratively with the client to come up with the best plan uh, to infuse these religious elements into the treatment. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to kind of wrap things up a little bit today, but again, I just wanted to, you know, thank everybody for coming to this kind of a panel because, let's be honest, it sort of sounds like it's the start of some sort of joke, right? An atheist, a Muslim, a Christian, a humanist, and a Jew walk into ABCT, right? It's like, it sounds like we're getting ready to have some sort of a punchline there. Um, and we, we weren't, it turns out. Uh, we were actually serious about it, so... Um, so I just want to talk just for a second about, you know, a lot of people when we talk about spirituality and we talk about religious issues, uh, we focus on people who have active religious beliefs, right? Um, so I just want to kind of just talk a little bit about the unique therapeutic needs of the non-religious. Um, because this is actually the fastest growing religious demographic uh, here in the U.S. in particular. And... Uh, most of the research that's out there actually identifies uh, non-theists uh, as a minority group that faces fairly regular discrimination. Um, so this is one of the few uh, religious belief areas where there's active discrimination in the legal system, for example. Here in the United States, there's seven states where you can't hold public office according to their state constitutions if you're an atheist. Um, <laughs> which is obviously completely unconstitutional and wouldn't hold up in court, but it's nonetheless on there. Um, so there's this unique kind of set of concerns that uh, the non-religious actually bring into therapy, just like any other particular group. Uh, and this just gives you an idea about sort of the strength of shift in this over the last uh, 25 years or so, where we've gone from less than 10% of our population identifying as uh, non-religious in some way to now about 30%. Uh, so we've seen a threefold increase just in the last 25 years. And the pace of this, particularly with our younger generation, continues to accelerate. Where when you look at our under 30s, you know, it's 35% or more compared to maybe 8% of our over 64s. So this is a very large uh, generational shift that's happening, which means that those of you going out in the world are gonna have more and more and more actively non-religious clients. So, you know, just to kind of echo a lot of what's been said here, you know, any of us who are doing good evidence-based therapeutic work, we tailor those, right? They're all based on effective case formulation. Um, and so it's really important for, you know, you to be both religiously competent and I would say actually non-religiously competent as well. Uh, because even when someone is not religious, that doesn't mean that there's just a uh, lack of something there. 
right? So instead, it's, okay, well, what are your specific non-religious beliefs, right? So if somebody asks me, for example, you know, what are your religious beliefs? And I say, well, I'm actually I'm non-religious. That doesn't mean that I don't have any sort of belief system, right? It's just like this big empty space. No, sorry, I just, no beliefs at all. Like, no, I'm a free-thinking, scientific skeptic, uh, secular humanist. And it's like, oh, I don't know what any of those words mean. Uh, well, it's time to learn, right? It's time to learn so you can have some very effective case formulation. Um, we also know that consulting with community leaders is very appropriate whether you're talking about specific religious belief or if you're talking about non-religious beliefs, for example. And you think, what, where do, do I go to the first church of atheism? Like, where is that, right? But it turns out there are community leaders for various kinds of non-religious beliefs as well that allow you to sink into that community uh, and be able to understand that. And then the other kind of, you know, third thing that I want to talk about is just kind of having a safe environment. Um, so if I'm having a tailored intervention, you know, you want to basically ask these kinds of questions when someone says that they're, you know, non-religious or they're atheist or whatever they happen to be. So someone can be like, you know, David had mentioned culturally religious, but not necessarily actively having some sort of specific faith. Uh, somebody can be experiencing doubt, right? So like I'm questioning things, but it's not that I'm necessarily turning actively away from faith. And you know, you have large numbers of people who consider themselves not religious, but at the same time they don't want to leave that because of social, family reasons, uh, work reasons, even sometimes. And then, you know, maybe this is somebody who religion wasn't ever actually a factor in their life. And that's a very different population than someone who's coming out of, for example, a, a fundamentalist kind of background. Uh, and that's things that you need to do. And that's why, you know, it's very important to kind of consult externally, right, and understand what people know in terms of uh, their past religious beliefs. So being able to understand if someone's coming out of a Pentecostal versus uh, a Mormon versus a Jewish background, right? Like you've got a different set of beliefs there that you're going to be dealing with. Um, people are often very surprised at the breadth of knowledge, for example, that I have about various religions. They're like, but you're an atheist. Right, but I still work with people who come from all sorts of backgrounds, right? Uh, and that's a very important set of knowledge to have. Um, and so, you know, leaders, either local leaders, national leaders, and kinds of humanist or atheist organizations can help provide resources. Um, I'll show you guys some of those here in a minute. And then one of the other things that is very, very important to do is kind of check your own personal biases uh, by consulting with other mental health professionals there. Um, as we'll talk about in a minute, there's actually specific projects that have been developed as a result of too many clinicians having their own personal biases come out in session. Um, and that's kind of where, you know, you need to know yourself. Um, you need to understand your own particular responses to someone who is religious or non-religious or a particular religious background. Um, so, you know, my non-religiosity, for example, very rarely comes out when I'm doing therapy. It's only if someone specifically is seeking someone who's non-religious to talk to that it becomes out. But I often have my clients say things like, you know, thank you so much, I'm grateful to God that, you know, we were able to find you and things like that. And I don't be like, <laughs> I don't believe in that nonsense. Get out of here. Right? And I was like, no. Like, you accept that. Amen. Yeah. Uh, you know, so what are your own personal biases? What are your own personal values? What's your own personal religious background? Knowledge or lack thereof? You know, basically, are you a safe therapist, right? Uh, whether you're working with adolescents, you know, and having to deal with confidentiality issues, where you've got someone who is non-religious, but, you know, they're not really able to be out because they're still living at home, <laughs> right? Or they would lose, you know, they'd get kicked out of the house, which is something we've seen a lot. Um, there's a lot of overlap between actually our LGBT community and what they experience in coming out as to what our non-religious non population experience. A very similar process. So, you know, be aware of your own biases, uh, but at the same time, be very respectful of you know, the dignity of other people, uh, their own autonomy, uh, their decision-making choices, and be aware of your influence as a therapist. Uh, you know, as we learned from Spider-Man series, with great power comes great responsibility, right? Uh, 
and you are in a position of power. Um, even if you're setting yourself up or trying to do your best to not be in a position of power, therapy relationship, you are. They're coming to you for reasons, and that places you automatically in a set of power. And if I, uh, you know, happen to wield that power not usefully or ineffectively, then that's got some pretty big consequences. So think about how you're presenting yourself. Um, because how you present yourself, how you present your physical environment, really sets up expectations. Um, so if, you know, I, if I'm a non-religious person and I walk into the office and I'm, I'm just, I'm seeking help for, you know, struggles with depression or OCD or whatever it happens to be, and I walk in and there's scripture in the office, there's crosses all over the walls, or, you know, my therapist is wearing very overt sort of religious jewelry uh, or using overtly religious speech, that depending on the individual, could be, you know, sort of damaging to your rapport. Uh, we've got a large number of folks who come out of uh, what I would call a abusive religious background, who any of those kinds of things are very much triggers for anxiety, PTSD, panic attacks, um, which then shuts that down in therapy, and they may never then come back, they may assume that that's how it is in a therapeutic relationship. Um, I've dealt with this in a number of ways because I direct our practicum experiences for our graduate students and one of them comes in and says, my supervisor's office is literally, every wall is covered in crosses and I think it's making our clients feel very uncomfortable because it's not a religiously based center, it's like a community based organization. Uh, I said, well, how do you talk to them about that? Because it certainly, particularly for the 30% you know, of folks who are not actively religious now, could be negative, or someone from a different religious faith, right, can come in and have that kind of negative response, potentially. So in terms of particular specific therapeutic issues that we often see people struggle with, uh, discrimination is a big one, um, and this can be sort of passive or active discrimination, uh, loss of a social network, loss of social support, because now I'm no longer religious and my family still are, and I'm considered the, you know, the black sheep of the family, and I'm shunned from various you know, religiously oriented holidays. Um, I lost my community, right? I lost my church community. Um, I have friends that no longer talk to me, so you need to work on rebuilding friendships. Uh, a lot of people, particularly in the kind of the Midwest area, have feelings of isolation. You know, like, it's just me. <laughs> uh, what do I do? Everyone else around me is very different from me. Um, there are also issues of religiously based abuse. Um, Marlene Winnell uh, has written about this for a few decades in terms of what she calls religious uh, trauma. Uh, and it's very much PTSD just as a result of this specific background, right? Um, and then having lots of conflicts between here's what I did believe, or what I was, I was raised to believe, but here's what I believe now. And I'm having a lot of struggle with that. So, you know, something I've seen relatively often is a fear of hell, for example. And that fear of hell, like, I'm, I'm no longer religious, why am I still so worried about that? I'm so concerned about that. Um, which is kind of like this, well, I don't know, let's figure that out. What's going on there? Um, so, a lot of different kind of issues. Um, for those of you who are interested in kind of learning more about this, um, some nice kind of large-scale organizations, um, the one that I work with the most is Recovering from a Religion. Specifically, I'm the director of what's called the Secular Therapy Project, which helps match up individuals who are seeking secular evidence-based practice uh, with good, screened, <laughs> secular evidence-based licensed therapists. We end up rejecting about 40% of our therapist applicants, uh, because mostly because they're not evidence-based, to be honest. Um, the Center for Inquiry, uh, American Atheists, the Freedom from Religion Foundation, all these places have websites. Another good thing um, that's happened in the last 20 years is the internet. I don't know if anyone's heard of that before. Uh, but it's often very useful for our non-religious folks because they can sort of have a, a gradual exposure to and coming out of uh, that religious. So a lot of these local groups like the Oklahoma Atheists, for example, San Diego Humanist, things like that, have either public or private or hidden kind of Facebook groups. Um, and so for people who can't be out openly, for people who are in more rural areas, this provides actually some support and some community. It's not as good as the physical, like interacting with people, but 
it's much better than nothing. So, so. Um, so what I'd like to do now is I'm just kind of open it up. Uh, if anybody has specific questions for the panel or just the panel generally, um, I know Dave has to leave for too long, so or maybe yeah. right now. I, I just have I, my office booked a, a flight, which is a little bit soon, <laughs> so I'll be praying on the way to the airport. <laughs> um, so maybe I'll just make a couple comments and then get out of here. Um, I think one of the most important comments was something that, uh, that Shadi said, which is that um, this whole uh, approach here we're seeing at, at this panel and in general is tailoring evidence-based principles and practices to the unique characteristics of the pe person who's in front of you. And um, it doesn't really matter what their faith is or lack thereof. It matters that we're aware of it though, and that we're asking questions about it, and we get confidence, and we get uh, we bring that into the treatment to the extent that it is clinically relevant. Um, so I think that's extremely important. I'll just add a piece of uh, data to support that. We did a study at McLean Hospital on uh, the extent to which our patients wanted spirituality to be part of their treatment process. I was expecting about 25% of the patients would say that they wanted to speak to their clinicians about treat about their spirituality and treatment. Turned out it was much higher, it was actually 58.2%. This is in Eastern Massachusetts, which was a bit surprising to me, had fairly, moderately, or very strong interest. We looked at uh, predictors of that. What we found was that individuals who had a religion, we compared people who were affiliated and were not affiliated with a religious group. What we found was that about, I think it was 20 or 25%, somewhere in that range, of individuals with no religious um, affiliation still wanted to have spirituality as a part of the discussion in their in their therapy um, and conversely this is relevant to what you said Caleb is that about a, a, a similar number uh, it was between I think 25 and 30 percent a little higher if I'm not mistaken um, wanted who, who had who had a religious affiliation were affiliated with the religion they did not want spirituality to be part of their treatment so it turns out that the most important question is not is there a religion that you affiliate with? Is faith a part of your life? But do you want to speak about spiritual or religious issues with me in therapy? Kind of like it doesn't matter whether a patient's married or not married. If they want to speak about marriage, then if you're their therapist, then you need to speak to them about that, you know, regardless of where they are on the spectrum. That's sort of the and the point I would like to make about that before David gets out of the room is hopefully I was able to demonstrate that people who want to bring spirituality into their uh, process need not have a dualistic view of the world. The spiritual option is available for people who are not dualists. Amen. Amen? <laughs> okay, I got a flight to cash. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Does anybody have any specific questions or you know, points, something that you've worked with and struggled with with some of your clients? We've got 10 minutes or so left, I think. Yeah. Um, I think he touched a little bit on what my question was going to be for you, but I do see religiosity and spirituality as like interrelated but distinct constructs. Certainly. And um, I was wondering for you in your secular therapy if you see that spirituality is separate as well. Or like if for your clients, if you're distinctly seeking people that want to separate spirituality and religiosity. Yeah, good question. So um, again, we've got about 30% of the U.S. who identifies as non-religious. Mm -hmm. uh, of that, only about 2% actively identifies as atheistic. Right. Right. We've got another 7 or 8% who identify as agnostic. And then you've got the bigger chunk of that, actually, about 20% uh, total of people who identify either as just generally non-religious or spiritual but non-religious right um, and so one of the things about that is you have to get a great operational definition of what that means right so like I'm not religious but I've had spiritual expenses or experiences right like I went to uh, Stonehenge and, for, and I climbed Machu Picchu and to me those things were like these amazing spiritual experiences but I'm not religious right so what does that mean to you like if you want to have kind of a spiritual life or a spiritual experience you know, what does that mean for you as a non-religious person, as a Christian, as a Muslim? Uh, and so being able to, I think, identify that is, is useful. And that's something that we as good case conceptualizers, <laughs> right, can help them do, right? Like, specifically, what is your goal? Um, 
I mean, I work with people from all religious backgrounds, and you know, the big thing that for me is useful is okay. It's not so much what do you believe; it's what do you want to do that you're not doing right now. Right? Like what's what's preventing you from getting to where you are? Um, and sometimes that's a specific aspect of my my past, like religious history, for example. Sometimes that's a belief that's become sort of uh, inappropriately entwined in, in my behavior. Or, uh, so it's not, I, I mean, we're not necessarily seeking, like, you're atheistic, but you still need to have spiritual experiences, or you're spiritual, but you need to get rid of that, right? So it's more of, like, again, how do I meet the person with where they are and give them the ability to, uh, to accomplish those goals that they're not able to do on their own right now? I think that's really the important. Well, oh, go ahead. No, no, There's you another question. question. <laughs> well, what I was going to say is, um, the in my view, the power of being able to make contact with this spiritual dimension, because it gives you the ability to make, I mean, that's really the place where choice comes from. There's nothing you can do that can't be done. And if you have a dualistic view of the world, and you have practices uh, in that uh, orientation that help people get to this place, then that's really important to help them get to this place. Because that's the place that when you're terribly afraid or terribly sad or you know, greatly experiencing pain, it's the place from which you can know experientially that it can't touch you. And that gives a lot of power to act in the difficulties that you're facing. Just some core aspects of CBT. Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry, I mean, there are many different aspects of diversity, of course, in humans, uh, gender identity, gender preference, uh, sexual preferences. Uh, SES and you know, so on. Uh, I'm just curious of the panelists if you prioritize religiosity or spirituality over other dimensions of individual differences in the work that you do, or should you, or you know, what's your orientation with respect to the other areas of, of difference? I would prioritize it if the client prioritizes it, but, I, but I, I, I personally wouldn't just flat out prioritize religion because then they may or may not identify religion as something that's making a huge impact on their life. Um, or there may be other elements that are making a bigger impact, if that makes sense. So again, I, I, I espouse a, a very individualistic, ideographic approach uh, to tailoring treatments and, and emphasizing different parts of the training. Yeah. I would agree with that. I, in my intake, I would ask about all those different elements. Um, I think all of us probably are known now for this area, so I do have clients that seek me out specifically because I do that type of therapy. And so in that respect, yeah, we put more greater uh, emphasis on that. Um, someone like me finds themselves in a, in a very funny place. I, I have a pamphlet that's 25 years old, How to Stop Driving Yourself Crazy with Help from Christian Scriptures. It's out there free, it's on the internet. Sometimes people find it, they come to see me assuming that I am a practicing Christian. And, and at least 20 years ago, I got enormous blowback over uh, being a deceptive practitioner because I didn't stay at the very front end. I actually am not a dualist. Um, and I've had people say to me at the, you know a few sessions in or at the end, well, you're actually a Christian, you just don't know it. <laughs> uh, so, Part of my intake form asks, uh, how religious would you describe yourself, zero to 10? And when people start describing themselves as very religious, then I'm very interested in that because they are going to bring already into the room beliefs and practices that may be very helpful to them. And so I can, from the very outset, start drawing on those things. Uh, I mean, for me, it's very similar where, you know, the vast majority of the clients that I work with, for example, they have no idea what my religious background is. Um, and I may know theirs, but it may have zero to do with therapy. Um, 
because I'm training them for Trinitomania or OCD that has no religious component or something like that. So, you know, I think it really goes back to that. You know, where is this person? Where are their difficulties stemming from? Right? This sort of ideographic approach that we can take our nomothetic theories and apply on there. Um, so it's, and this is what I often tell my students when they look at, you know, like our structured intake that they have to do for clients. They're like, ah, why, why is it so big? <laughs> right? Like, there's so many questions. Don't they know what's going on? And we can just say, what's the problem? Uh, it's like, well, no. Like, it turns out, no. Uh, insight does not actually equal change, right? Or otherwise people wouldn't be here. Uh, or, you know, the psychodynamic and Freudian therapy would work wonders, right? Uh, oh, here's what it is. So, you know, sometimes things that are very important, they don't realize are important. So you have to ask about that broad spectrum of issues, whether it's religious belief or sexuality or uh, trauma history or whatever. Or the flip side is that it's really important, but if they don't get asked the question, they don't think it's important to you. So I've had the experience with clients, and I'll ask them, is religion or spirituality important to you? Or are you practicing something? And they've literally like leaned over and whispered, like, can I talk about that here? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, but until I gave them like permission to do that, they, they didn't. Um, another thing is, uh, if I'm going to introduce the spiritual dimension uh, in my work, which I'm going to probably do, uh, I'm careful about how I talk about it. Now, if I say to you, uh, we're going to talk about this cup, and somebody says, cups, my God, we can't talk about cups, cups are not here. And I say, oh, okay, well, how about a container? Oh, okay, container's okay. <laughs> so, you know, the language has to be moved around so that it's usable and workable for the client. And I think if, if the religious language is what's workable and you can, because people often can, they'll tell you if you don't know, just ask them, they'll tell you. Uh, and then you can move it right in to be of help or change it so that they can have contact with this experience without, you know, well, we can't have that. Yeah, I think we got one more. So some individuals identify as religious and mention about their life their sexuality is such that they no longer are questioning, they no longer identify as heterosexual. Unfortunately, even up today's, even in today's age, uh, at least among the major religions of the world, it's either that you're religious and straight or you're not. You have to choose between these worlds. So how would you reconcile with, how would you help someone who their sexuality and their religious beliefs they've got highly value in their lives. How would you help that individual? I mean, something I've done just in the past, actually, is, okay, well, so those are your beliefs. Maybe we should find you a group that matches those beliefs rather than you having these beliefs and trying to stick in your same group, right? So maybe, maybe I'm Christian, I'm coming out of a Pentecostal background where that's very, very frowned upon. Okay, well, maybe we can find a different Christian denomination because there's a couple of those in terms uh, that's more accepting of this kind of diversity, uh, or whether that's uh, a Muslim, you know, particular kind of uh, group or a slightly different kind of belief set there. Uh, I think that's a big part of that sort of finding uh, community and finding that social support, which is a big thing that Michelle talked about. I mean, along the same lines, I would, I would probably help you be okay with who you are within the religion by consulting with religious leaders, by uh, by finding people who, who are okay with who they are within within that religious community as well. So, so but yeah, definitely meet you where where you are. I'm talking about any of that inner conflict that that person has within them. That I both of these things are important to me, and now suddenly I'm not fitting into the community. And how am I? I did my graduate work in Lincoln, Nebraska, and my wife worked at the adolescent unit of the state hospital. And uh, very often the effective treatment was when the young person was released, they were released into Lincoln or Omaha and not back into western Nebraska. So find a group where you have a shot, and I want to underline, 
This is a great thing about the internet because now you have access to the entire world. And it is true that you, you know, you don't have the pressing the flesh, which is for human beings, this is an important thing, but you can at least have a kind of connection that you otherwise wouldn't be able to have. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it.